Right. So the polls are now done. Um, let me let me now just give you presenter control quickly. Um, okay. The just remember as soon as you share your screen, the audience will be able to see that. So just um, get your slideshow up in full screen first, and then share your screen. Um, but don't move on from like your first slide because um, even though mm -hmm. we're not on, even though we're not on air yet, they or the audience will see the screen sharing. If so, I mean. Okay. I don't see anybody signed in yet. Um, yeah, I can see some attendees have started to arrive on my control panel. Okay. If you don't see the poll results, I, I, I'll just read them out if that's okay. Okay. That's okay. fine. Okay. Great. So you should have your um, dialog box saying that you've been made presenter. Um, and then once your slides are up in slideshow mode, you can share your screen. Okay. Okay. Um, so then we then we'll be ready. Um, did you? I'm not sure if I asked how you'd like to be introduced or what your sort of title as such. Is it was it ITIL author? Uh, ITIL author and ITSM best practice director for to manage. ITSM best practice. Okay. Okay, great. So I'll just do a really brief intro, and then I'll and then I'll I'll speak to you basically, and let you take it from there, um, if that's okay. And I'll just remind everybody to post questions. Um, if you want, you you can present the poll questions. Then I'll start after you do that. Okay. Okay. Um, all right. Then I I will do that. Um, shall I? Um, I'll say hello to you first before I do the poll though, just um, to kind of so that that's not awkward then when I hand back to when I hand over to you. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. All right. <laughs> okay. Great. So, um, <laughs> so intro poll um, and then hand over and you're ready to share your screen, are you? Yeah, I'm ready. Um, so do you want to, why don't you put your front slide up? So that when I go online, so that when we go on air, sorry, it's um, it's your title slide that they can see. Okay, I want to make sure you can see it too. Yeah, so. then I know, yeah, and then and then I'll and then I'll start in a second. Did you get that? Did you get the notification that you've made been made presenter? No. Nope. Ah, it's not was it not doing it? Um, I'm gonna try it again. Cause it's come up for me with a notification. It shows Rob as presenter. Yeah, I know. It's it's giving me the it's giving me the box that says, "Are you sure?" And then I'm ticking yes and pre pressing yes, and it's obviously not going through to you. Um, I tell you what, I'll gonna do I'm just gonna I've got it set up on two machines so I'm just gonna run over to the other machine okay. and see if it see if it will do it from there okay. all right one second Has that now worked? Yep. Can you see my screen? Um, I can't. Yeah, it might just be. It might just be taking a minute. Right. I want to make sure you can see the right one. I have two monitors. One that shows the uh, slides. Yeah. And the next slide, then the. Um. Okay. I'm going 
gonna close. I'm gonna close mine, open it. Oh. I think it's this, I think this laptop is, is playing up or it's behind or something because it's saying that you're now presenter, like obviously and you can see your presenter, but mine isn't changing. Um, I'm going to have to, I'm going to have to go in and check it again um, and then come back and do the audio from here because we're going to okay. need to start, we're going to need to start really. Okay. Sorry about this. I'll just, I'll just go and check it. Okay, it's showing it's showing on the other PC. Um, we'll just have to, if anything goes wrong, like say with the polls or anything, we'll just have to keep going because I know that from your side it's all fine. So. Okay, all good. Okay, all right. Let me start off then, so they don't. Um, <laughs> so we're not too much later. Okay. Um, right, ready? Yeah. Okay, here we go. The broadcast is now starting. All attendees are in listen-only mode. Hello and welcome everybody to today's webinar. Uh, it's all about moving from change approval to change management today. Um, and I'm delighted to be joined today by ITIL author and ITSM best practice director for Samanage, Anthony Orr. Hi, Anthony. Uh, good morning, uh, from my point of view. <laughs> yeah, from your part of the world, absolutely. Thanks for joining us today. You're welcome. Nice to be here. Excellent. And uh, in a in a moment, I'll hand over to you to begin your presentation. Um, before we do that, we're just going to see if we can take a couple of quick polls. Um, so if you, for everybody listening, if you can have a look at your screen, and we're just going to ask you a few, three basic questions, just so that um, Anthony can get an idea um, of what of um, who we've got listening today. Okay, so let me launch the first one here. Um, right, that's just thinking about launching. Um, not sure that's going to work for us at the second. So um, what we'll do, Anthony, if it's okay with you, is um, we'll carry on with your presentation because I know that yours is all working fine. Okay. Is that okay? Yep, let's, let's get started and all have right. some fun. Brilliant. All right. Thanks very much. All right. Uh, thanks for attending, everyone. Uh, again, my name is Anthony Orr. I am one of the ITO 2011 authors. I also work for Symantec as the ITSM Best Practice Director. I've been working in IT for a number of years. One of the things I like to tell people, even before I knew ITO, I was practicing, you know, ITO of, of practices. But I had some challenges with my practice because I didn't really understand ITO at that time. But I was just doing the best job I can, you know, in the jobs that I had, been doing capacity management availability, service level management, and a number of other ITO process areas. So one of the things that uh, you know, some of the ITO authors say and, uh, and the experts, they say, you know, ITO sometimes at the end of the day is common sense. But one of the things that you really have to do is really understand the best practices so you can get even better value out of what you're doing. And change management, our subject today, is one of those areas that a lot of organizations, they uh, uh, say they do change management, but they have a lot of challenges around change management as it relates to executing and really getting value from the change management process and the practices that they have in, in their organization. So to start off the session, let's just talk about what change management is. Uh, and, and I told every process area has a, 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 an objective that people should really pay attention to because this helps distinguish you no know, one process area from another process area so you can know so you know which process area sort of has authority for the decisions that you're making related to a particular area 
So change management says the primary objective of change management is to enable beneficial changes to be made with minimal disruption to IT services. That word beneficial, one of the things I have to tell the audience today, you know, as an ITO author, we're very particular in the language that we use when we uh, give our definitions and we de define things and so forth. So this key word in here, beneficial, now what does beneficial mean? There's beneficial changes that can be made from an operational perspective or a tactical perspective or from a strategic perspective. So we actually break up change management in, into those areas and things can be operational, tactical, strategic changes at the end of the day. So let's, let's continue and talk a little bit more about change management. Some typical issues as relates to uh, change management, for example, change implementation affects production service availability. You can't imagine the number of organizations that you know, have come to me and have told me symptoms of things that are going on within their organization. And I would tell them, so it sounds like you have a, a, a problem within your change management process. And they'll tell me, no, 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 Anthony, it couldn't be that. We have change management process, it has to be something else. I'm like, huh? Okay, let's let's talk about this. Let's dig a little bit more deeper into how you do change management as it relates to this challenge that you're trying to overcome within your organization. Number two, change causes increase in incident and problems. There's one organization that told me one time, he says, you know, Anthony, when my technical people take a, a leave of absence, you no, know, our number of incidents and problems go down. We have very few issues which is, no, you, you, can, you can think about that as related to some organizations that you know, uh, lock down their systems from changing uh, uh, during certain uh, periods of time. For example, a company like Visa or a credit card company, American Express, they may lock down changes within their environment around the Christmas season. They don't want any risks related to a change affecting the ability for a customer to be able to do business with them. Can you imagine going into the store and all of a sudden you said, well, here's my visa, and, and, and the person says, well, sorry, we've been having problems with visa all day. Oh, no problem, I got a MasterCard or American Express or one of the other credit cards. And you know how much money and the, the financial impact, you know, a change may have made within that environment that's causing them not to be able to bit do business with their customers. Number three, small changes don't need to be a part of formal process. One of the things that a lot of people, the people that are responsible for changes in organizations say, is, you know, when I put in a small change, nobody need, need, needs to know about this. Matter of fact, they won't understand it. It's not gonna harm anything. And then you go to a, a meeting later and then something happened and, it, and you ask the question, did anybody make any changes? And all of a sudden it's quiet. And all of a sudden someone, well, I made some changes, but they're very small, so they couldn't have the effect on what, what, what you're talking about. And a matter of fact, it did have an effect. One of the things we have to do with people, we have to make sure that they understand, you know, the management of change, especially the formal management of change, helps manage risks for the organization. And we really need to do this effectively. It's not about being bureaucratic or slowing down their work efforts or, or anything like that. It's about, it's about making sure that the business has continuity and it's able to function and deliver value to its customers, whether those customers are internal or external to the organization. Overall, bad change management affects service capabilities, which affect your customers. So if you don't do change management effectively, uh, you can have a big impact again on your customers, whether they're internal or external to your organization. So many organizations are really struggling with proving the value of our, our IT changes. One, one of the things that, and it could be a big list of things on, on, on this slide, they're not following best practices for changes, which sometimes like the theme of this uh, session is moving from change approval to change management. What I see a lot of organizations do, they do approvals and they do what is called throw the change over the fence. And then the, and the technical people or the application management people or the DevOps people or whoever who's going to implement that change, they get it. And we find out that those people are working in their silos, you know, from an application perspective, technical perspective, network perspective, and so forth. So they're each, you know, bringing down the systems, you know, to do their part of the change and so forth. And then you, you, you really having a challenge with, with uh, the value of your, your business service. 
So let's let's go back a little and just look at the, the definition of a change, so that we sort of understand this uh, uh, as we talk about uh, this uh, to, uh, in this session today. And the reason why I, I do things like this is because I think foundational knowledge helps keeps us grounded in the, in the objectives that we're trying to, to get to. So when you look at the definition of a change, it says the addition, modification, or removal. So the life cycle of that change, you add something, you modify it or remove. Sometimes, and, and the reason why I put this up here too, is because sometimes a lot of organizations don't think of removals as you know uh, something that needs to be managed. But removal of anything in the environment can cause a risk again. So, and the definition says removal of anything that could have an effect or risk on IT services. Management of the of the life cycle of change is important, and the focus on this is really talking about service changes, not things like you know, facility changes and and things like that. There's a three uh, types of changes that uh, everyone needs to be aware of. It's normal, standard, and emergency. Now the challenge with these definitions is that these are, you know, uh, organizational specific. You have to really define what a normal change is within your organization. Besides the ITO definition, well, what it says, you have to define what it is in your organization. Standard, pre-approved, you no know, uh, type of changes. Those changes have to be defined also. You know what is really pre-approved? It's related to risk. You know, so low risk can be pre-approved. You know, so that uh, things can happen quickly within the organization based on that that uh, need for, you know, uh, agility in an organization. And then what's an emergency change? Sometimes when I ask this question, uh, people give me the answer right away. They say, oh, something that has to be done right away. And uh, I said, no, it has to be defined by the organization. I say, anybody, and some of you on the call probably seen somebody come up and say, oh, I got an emergency change. From my perspective, something that needs to be done right away. But from the organization's perspective, it doesn't have to be an emergency. It can wait till tomorrow or something. And sometimes emergency changes are disruptions and cause risks within the organization. But, I can't but sometimes, and, and, and what I was uh, uh, saying before, and the discussion around this uh, uh, session today, is a typical change management sometimes is just approving the change yeah, no, and then giving it to the implementers. Let me give you an example of that. So here's the day in the life of a service. A service that's being consumed by your customers, again, whether they're internal or external. A change has been um, uh, approved for that service. Now that the change has been approved, the database people get the change, so they take the service down and they put in the database changes. The network people get the change, they take the, 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 the server down again and put in the network stuff. See, Application people get the change, they take the, the service down again. All of a sudden the service is back up and available. Then somebody else you know, that's involved in the change takes it down. And then you find out, you know, well, the service was only available for one hour that day because we're too busy making changes to it, or two hours that day. What value can we realize from a service from a warranty perspective to our customers that has such small availability because of all the changes. So we have to be careful of those type of things within our environment. So one of the key things uh, around change management, and you've been hearing me sort of say this as we've been going through the, the presentation, is that it's really about service, you know, focus on service, not just IT. Even when you're thinking about a strategic change or tactical changes or operational changes, you should have a, a, a perspective of what the service that's being affected, because the service is what defines the, your relationship between you and your customer. And affecting that uh, service is a risk to the organizational viability and so forth. It can make IT optional, it can make IT you know, have a bad reputation. And if IT has a bad reputation related to the services being delivered, those external services that are being delivered by your organization could cause a bad reputation for your company. And then the, the spiral continues and you become not as competitive as you used to be just because you didn't manage changes effectively. And you got to remember the difference between approval versus management, which I'm going to talk about on the next slide in a lot more detail. You got to understand the process and the needed capabilities. I'm going to show you the change management process, not just change approval, but the management process and the way that you should think about it. And change management does not work in a silo by itself. One of the things as an ITIL author that we try to get across to 
people and organizations all the time that ITO is really about IT service management not just IT process management. So the key word again is service, IT service management, looking at things more holistically. And when you do that, you don't just focus on change management by itself, because if you do that, you actually can create shadow IT initiatives with the change management process or within an incident management process or problem management process, where that process is trying to do everything and be everything that it can be without leveraging other strategic capabilities of the business that are defined by the processes that you have in place. So you have to be careful there and really understand how change management works, you know, with other process areas. So let's talk about that in more, in more detail. So within a process itself, that, that you know, if you look at the ITO process model, there's certain uh, things that are going on within that process model. First, every process has an input or trigger. The difference between an input and a trigger, for example, a trigger could be, you know, yearly planning that you know, triggers the process to happen. Or input could be, for example, like within the change management process, a request for change, RFC comes in. So it comes into the, the change management process. Then if you think about the process itself, it has activities, there's going to be governance around the process, and then it's going to produce some type of output or for uh, another process. So change management, one of the first things we do is detect and record that there's a change there. We want to make sure that we document everything that's going on within the process. So every activity within the change management process should have a metric associated to it or KPI related to the a critical success factor related to an objective of the activity itself. So when you think about a KPI for detecting and recording, you, you can look at, you know, the number of uh, changes that are uh, approved versus not approved or the ones that you uh, didn't see and, and so forth. So there's lots of things that you can do there. But once that happens, you know, if you, especially if you're using technology, what you're actually doing is creating a change record. So now the record is related to the request for change. The change record and the request for change or the change proposal is a little bit different from each other. So the change record now is going to articulate what's going on within the change management process itself. The next thing you do is review and categorize the change. This helps gives the change manager insight to you know what to do next with this change. Is it a change for a, a service that has a high visibility in organization that delivers 80% of the revenue or, or something like that? You know, then when I get to the next step, that's going to be input and help me prioritize. You know, you know what should I do first within with, within the list of things that I have? Because sometimes we may not even get to all the Thank things you. that we have Thank to do you. within a, a timely period of time. Well, we want to make sure we get to the most important stuff first. And that's what prioritization is really all about. We get to approval now of the change. So and what we're doing is what a lot of organizations stop at. after they approve the change. That's it. They sort of throw the change over the fence, as we say, and then the, <clears throat> let the other functions and organization start working on it. But we get to the approval process uh, or activity within change management. We usually uh, get involved, uh, uh, use what's called a CAP or change advisory board. The change advisory board is made up different types of stakeholders depending on their knowledge of the change. And one mistake that I see a lot of organizations make, they put people on the CAP that have no clue about what the change is really all about. And, and they make, make comments that derail the effectiveness and efficiency of getting the change through the overall process. So you got to be careful with that. Don't just include people because they have a certain title or, or, or things like that. But the type of uh, uh, people or stakeholders that you may want to include is, for example, somebody that has a technical perspective to understand that the change can be implemented within your environment. Somebody has a financial perspective, I understand that you have budget for the change and, and for, and then somebody has a customer perspective, like uh, the, the service owner or even the customer themselves, they can be on, on your cab. So that if you're actually gonna approve a change, you wanna make sure it has business value. So that perspective or that advice from the advisory board made up of those people can be valuable to the change authority or the change manager that's formalizing this process within the organization. 
So you get approval for the for the change now. You want to get the change, you know, executed on. And, and like I said earlier, sometimes it sort of gets thrown into this cloud or just thrown over the fence, and, the, and different parts of the organization start working on it, bringing down the system and scheduling time without any uh, thoughts about, you know, how this change is really affecting your business customers at the end of the day. But what you want to do is actually, you know, after it's been approved, send it over to release and deployment, mainly the release part of the release and deployment process. And release management is going to build the change, test the change, create back out plans, and so forth. They're going to say, wow, this, this, in order to put this change in, we're going to actually go back and tell the change manager, you know, how long it's going to take, what resources are going to be needed, and, and everything else, so the change manager can plan the implementation more effectively. But one of the things that you didn't see them do is actually just go implement the change. So they managed to release, make sure that they looked at things like the CMDB and understand release units and how things work together related to the services, how they can package things so that they don't have to keep bringing down the systems and, and interrupting the, the, uh, the value of a service to the customer. So after they do that, we send it back over to a channel change manager or the change authority. And what he wants to do or she wants to do is actually create what's called a fourth schedule of change. So create a change calendar, say, oh, this is when we're gonna do this change. And so everybody knows about it. So there's gonna be some communication going on here. There's gonna be some risk analysis and okay, we're not gonna do the change on Friday because that's a busy production day for our customers. And I know in the past, we just you know thought Friday was a good day, but not so. So we're going to actually do the change on the weekend. I'm going to get the budget approved for overtime and make sure everybody's available so that they can you know, help with the uh, uh, deployment and implementation of this change. And another thing I'm going to communicate is a projected service outage. So if, the, so if I do have to do the change during the week when the customer is using the service, they're going to know that the service is down so that they can use that time more wisely. If I know the service is going to be down on Wednesday from 1 to 2 o'clock, I'm going to say, oh, maybe that's when I go to lunch. Or maybe that's when I'm going to schedule my meeting because I won't be able to do work related to the service and the technology that's in place. So uh, I can still get value from my time and my uh, contribution to the company and to the organization that I'm a part of. Thank you, Matt. So the change gets approved now for implementation. <laughs> now it goes to deployment management. They implement and they want to make sure everybody's ready. The training is done. They're going to interface with asset and configuration management and knowledge management, make sure all the documentation and everything gets updated and it's going to be a more coordinated and collaborative uh, way of making sure that the change is successful. We don't want to put a change in from that's successful from a technical perspective that nobody knows about. The, the service desk tool, for example, will change and all of a sudden the service desk people come in on the next day and, the, and, and they start using and they say, what happened? I don't know how to use this tool. Nobody trained me. Now there's another disruption and you created a risk to the successful uh, delivery and support of your services for your customers. You don't want to do that. You want to make sure everybody's ready, you know, for the change that's going in. And after uh, you uh, actually implement the change, you want to do what's called a post-implementation review. Make sure that the change had the desired do, um, effects. Make sure it has the desired so outcomes. If it didn't, out, one of the things you did earlier was re remediation planning. So now you can do back out and you can like, schedule the back out so that you can have less risk as you back things out of, uh, of the organization that weren't successful in meeting a particular outcome. Uh, and this is the, the yeah. change management process. Just, One of the things that hopefully you see yeah. here is that, you no, know, how can you move from change approval to change management? Is make the process more holistic, <clears throat> more collaborative, excuse me, and more coordinated within your organization so that it's not working in a silo. I've seen so many times organizations do change management in the silo that they approve things and all of a sudden, like, again, like I use the term, they throw it over the fence and then people uh, scramble and, and they get in each other's way and, and try to manage a change or things are out of order and, and so forth and it causes animosity related to different groups and finger pointing and things like that when you can work better as a team by really having a 
change management process versus just a change approval process. So let's continue. If you have any questions, please uh, post them in the question window and I answer them as we go along also. So now, after we do change management versus change approval, the day in the life of a service gets changed drastically. So now here's the service. Now all IT is working together more coordinated and collaborative. The service is not available, and maybe we create a, a projected service outage, or maybe we don't even have to do this because we found out the right window in, in order to put the change that has least impact to our customers or no impact to our customers. Now the service is available, everybody's happy, and, 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 and so forth within the organization. So change management, some key things to remember. You now approve the development of testing of the change, improve the implementation. So there's two steps or two approval uh, cycles. Approve you know, the, the change itself, then later go back and improve the implementation so that you can manage the change again. Make sure and release some deployment. I can look at release units and release packages so they can package things more effectively. Knowledge management plays a key role within the changes that you make because we have to make sure people understand and knowledge is communicated to the right people at the right time so they can you know embrace the change effectively. Otherwise, if they don't know, you know, it's gonna cause confusion and disruption. You become in, into more a chaotic state with the people. And you don't want that. And then you probably then go to reactive. Everybody trying to react to fix something, you know, and you really want just to deliver value from the beginning. And that's how you're going to do it. You now, change evaluation as a process can be key, you know, which is another process within uh, uh, ITO, within service transition. And then service validation and testing can be very, you know, uh, key to help uh, release and deployment to, you know, a, a more uh, better job with, um, validating the services and testing and making sure that they're following a good practices in, in, in those areas. Some common mistakes, again, at, you know, to reiterate some of the things I talked about earlier, it's not really understanding best practices, no, not even just for change for the other process areas and so forth, and doing better research to understand how to develop a change management process. What do I mean by that? Is that it really again it's not just about you know creating a process i've seen organizations do that but it's about the things around the process the technology the people the communication the governance and, and things like that that you have to understand too as it relates to the process uh, another thing that i've seen organizations do this oh wow we're going to do change management we're going to implement some technology and they implement the technology without thinking about how to improve on the challenges that, that they've had. So they, they're doing what they've always done, now they're formalizing it. When you do stuff like this, one of the things that's even in the ITO books and we talk about all the time, if you automate something that's broken, you can go out of business even faster. You can have more challenges, you know, with the things that you do. So be careful automating things that are broken or not as efficient and as effective that you want them to be. I've seen organizations put in other things around technology and then the outcomes or the business outcomes don't change. They say, wow, we put that new technology in and nothing changed, everything's still the same. We changed our process, but nothing changed, everything's still the same. Now make sure you don't fall into those type of traps. Not understanding the value of change management, articulating that value to the organization is a big mistake to make sure you know, people understand it's about managing risks, it's about helping the organization deliver better services and so forth. It's not about stopping them from doing their job or, you know, creating, you know, some type of performance issue with them, you know, being successful within the organization. And make sure the organization is committed to the process. One of the things I've, I've seen before, to, to give you an example of this, is that, you know, and, and change management, sometimes it's done in silos. So, not to say change approvals, but the management. So one function, like the, the technical team, has a change management process. Another function, the application management team, has a change management process. Another function has a change, and they don't work together because they're sharing a common infrastructure, so they come into conflict with each other. When it comes to managing a change that has repercussions for all three groups, so you got to make sure the executive team commits to how the change management process should work. And that's through policy and, and governance and, and so forth and roles and responsibilities that you have to put in with the process itself. Don't over engineer. Don't put too much complexity in the process. 
too many lines of communications, like I said, with the cabs. You know, sometimes I've seen cab meetings last all day because they have the wrong people in there for the changes, and people are just listening on the phone or they're, you know, just, you know, multitasking, and they're really not involved in, in, the, in the process itself because they didn't need to be there, you know, and, and then they become disruptive sometimes. So make sure you don't do that. So, and make sure you have trust with the other process areas. So if you're going to do change management, then you're going to have it integrated with release and deployment or an asset and config and knowledge. Trust the process that it, and, and that it's a specialized process and it's working effectively, that you don't have to check on the things that they do, but you know their outcomes are right. Tools and technology. Sometimes the uh, organization says, you know, when you're designing the process, you design the process first, and then you look for the tool. I say you do both at the same time. You need to understand the tool capabilities as you design the process. So you can understand what's going to be automated, what's going to be manual, how the tool is going to integrate, and what are the gaps? What else do you need, you know, related to the process working? And, and within a process, you, you, it sort of works that I do something manually, I use a tool, I do something manually, I, you know, make sure that you follow sort of lean practice as you, as you do stuff like that. Look for opportunities for automation of those manual things or digitization of, of what's going on within the, within the process stream itself or the value chain of the process. Make sure that you can automate and, and make things better and faster. And, and then understand, uh, do things like impact analysis for your capabilities. And uh, again, tool integration is important, not just process integration. And then there's something called drift management that you need, may need to pay attention to. And that is unauthorized changes. So if you see an unauthorized change or drift to a standard um, uh, configuration, that means that the ch no, and you don't have a change record, it's unauthorized. So drift management can help you with those type of things so that you can, you know, alleviate those type of problems and risk issues within your organization. So in order to enable change management, instead of just change approval, get people to comply, that's the most important aspect of this. Remove the resistance, make sure they know it's for their benefit, it's for the organization's benefit, and it's for the customer's benefit. Complete a formal process policy and procedures, and that's when you get executive commitment and buy-in. Train everybody, make sure everybody understands their roles and that it's natural for them to do it instead of you know going against the grain. And make sure the technologies support your process. And if, if they don't, you may need some customizations for the the uh, the uh, automation that you want to do. Now, if there's any questions, I'd be happy to to answer those. And you can also see uh, other webinars on the uh, Semantic website or uh, white papers and blogs around this subject in, in case you're interested. Zoe, uh, do you want to do the polling questions now? Hello. Yeah, fantastic. Thank you for that. Um, brilliant. We have got a few listeners' questions actually here. Um, but yeah, if you'd like to do the polls now, I can certainly see if we can get those over to you as well. Um, so would you like me to start with the, the first one about the location? Yep. So um, so guys, I'm just going to do those polls that I mentioned at the beginning. Um, and if you can if you can click on those quickly, it will just give us an idea um, so Anthony can see um, where you are and what's going on with you. So I've launched that first one now. And I'll just leave that running for a few more seconds. I can see we've got most people have answered it. Um, so. I'll close that off now. Thanks, everyone. Um, we've actually got 96% EMEA, so um, Europe, Middle East, Africa. We've got 4% in the Americas. Okay, great. Um, so I'll start the next one, and that is um, about your ITIL knowledge. So that one's opening now. If you can fill that one out, I'll be closing that in a few seconds time. 80% done. Last few people voting, 88%. Um, so the 
answers here. Let me close this poll now. Um, I'll share those with you. So um, we've got 32% at foundation level, 43% intermediate and 17% expert. Um, so that's 8% have, have answered none. So no ITIL knowledge. Okay, good. So, yep, it's around about the middle, isn't it? It's 43% intermediate. It's the biggest one there. Um, so let me hide that one. And there's one more. Bear with us. Just one more quick question. Just a yes, no on this one. So um, just about whether you actually are having some issues at the moment. So I'll be closing that in a few seconds time. And hopefully that's not 100 <laughs> percent. It's interesting, actually. It's currently looking at quite quite an interesting split. So a few more seconds to go. If the last of you could just have a quick vote. So we're at about 90 percent. So let me close that one off as well now and share those results. Um, we're at we're showing a, not a massive split, you know, 59% are and 41% aren't. So interesting, people obviously kind of looking for some tips on how to do it even better, even if they're not having major issues. Okay, were there any questions there were? Yeah, there were. So let's, okay. let me just go to those quickly now. Um, so the first one, it's quite a long one, so I'll read it out as it's been typed. Um, and it says, we're currently, we currently do not have a process for release management within our team. Would you classify a second change? For example, I'll be making this change to this specific service at this time, and if necessary, a third and fourth as sufficient release management. Um, the vast majority of our changes are operational rather than long-term sprintable development. Um, so I suppose that's about release little... management rather than... Yeah, but... I probably need a little bit more clarification on that question, but the, the, my comment on there mm -hmm. is that I find a lot of organizations, when I bring up release and uh, deployment management, they ask me, what is that? Because they sort of included it within sort of what they do sometimes from a change management perspective. Mm -hmm. Or they don't, uh, like the, the person who asked the question, he may say, thought, well, we really don't do that formally, but you probably do it informally. So there's probably some things going on there related to release and, and deployment that you probably just need to get a better handle on and incorporate within your overall change management process. Mm. And I see when organizations are doing that and they really don't understand release and, the, and deployment yeah. in that fashion, they're probably doing change approvals versus change management okay. based on what we talked about in this session. Yeah, okay, sure. Well, that question was from Aaron. So Aaron, if you have a follow up question at all, um, feel free to post that whilst we're talking. And if we can get to that at the end, we will. Um, there's another question here about, you know, do you have any practical advice or tips on how to help remove the resistance? So you talked about getting buy in and, and um, making sure that different stakeholders are on board. Do you have any tips for to help with that? Yeah, yeah, I have a, a lot of tips on that. Matter of fact, there's a a number of things that you can do, and uh, and you can actually do some searches on some of the things I talk. About. One of the things that's kind of effective is experiential learning. You know, the, some of the, uh, uh, the the things around that and, and change management that people actually go through. Maybe a half a day event, and they un and they get the aha moment as they go through understanding why change management is important. Another thing is the, the communication planning overall. You have to be real strategic with the way that you communicate you know, the why of change management. Yes. And when you do that, you have to make sure that you get executive buy-in and make sure the messages are crisp as it relates to the projects and the changes that you want to see and so forth. And even when you're doing communication planning, there's things I've seen organizations do, like create posters and uh, other communication in order to get people on board. And then there's the, the concept of creating heroes within your organization, mm. even though sometimes we say we don't want any heroes, but you want heroes or advocates for the things that you're doing. Yeah, yeah. The way that you do that is actually, you know, you find out people who have been successful with your, with your process and you highlight them and you, and you give them some type of praise and say, hey, uh, Mary uh, did such and such. You know, if you have more questions on how she was successful related to change, you know, give her you know, a, a call. And at the same time, you, you, you try to get to certain people in certain functional areas and, and get them to buy into what's going on. At the end of the day, when those people don't buy in, they're actually a risk to the organization. So you need to yeah. make plans for those type of people. 
yeah yeah and anticipate more things i can say about that <laughs> <laughs> okay we did actually we did a webinar not that long ago on customer advocacy and um, it definitely was highlighting all of those benefits for sure um with you know relation to whole whole host of things because that's often the one of the key factors i guess for any anything we're trying to achieve um so we have a couple more questions that i'll put to you if we've got time um quickly so I have one here from Sanjeev and he's asked um, how to better manage the change approval when one release is dependent on a bundle issue fix and the impact is high. Again, it might, might need a little bit of... Yeah, a little bit more clarification yeah. on, on that. But one of the things when, when you're um, managing uh, uh, changes and, and that manner, one of the things for you first sort of have to do to get a better handle on that is sort of what I call take inventory of what your mm -hmm. capabilities and how your services are done within the organization. And that sometimes begins with creating service models so that you have a, a perspective on how uh, you no. Know, different changes are going to affect the organization and how to manage that from a release unit uh, perspective and so forth. Mm -hmm. So if you don't know what you have, it's hard to, uh, to manage, you know, uh, or related to that question. So you have to know what you have. So CMDBs, CMSs, and that type of data related to your technology, it becomes very important for you to be able to accomplish that outcome. Mm -hmm. Okay. Okay. Brilliant. Um, and we've, got a new question just popped up uh, from Julie and she's asked the change categories that you mentioned. Um, she says you mentioned operational and strategic. Was there a third category? Tactical. tactical. The third one was tactical. Okay. Um, so let's see, hopefully Julie that answers. If you have a follow up question, do do post it in the next few minutes. Um, Aaron has got in touch again and he's said um, he appreciates your answer. Thank you for that. Um, and he says that they've incorporated everything into one process it won't easy to easy easy to digest process um but he says they'll be looking towards the separation into release and deployment so he said thanks very much for that and, and a, a little follow-up on that when you when you do that it's, it's really again it's still not one process but when you think service orientated it's, it's processes working together mm -hmm. so the change management process just needs to be integrated with those other process areas, but you still have a change management process. You still have a release and deployment process. You still have a asset and configuration management process because there's specializations that those processes need to uh, uh, deliver to the organization. But at the same time, there's uh, components or activities within those processes that allow coordination and collaboration with other processes. So mm -hmm. those other processes don't have to do it themselves, if that makes yeah. sense. Yep, yeah, I think that makes that makes absolute sense. Thank you. Um, and in terms of the stage um, that we talked about evaluating a change, um, who should be involved in that? Is that everybody who it affects or is that a kind of a, a group, a strategic group of people or? Uh, more of a strategic group of people uh, because the challenge that I've seen, you know, if you think about real life and you, and you uh, and what happens in some organizations, they bring too many people mm. and the more people you have, the more complexity you have within the trying to get something done. So you have to be very strategic in the type of people that yeah. you pick for evaluating changes on your cab and so forth. Okay. I've seen hundreds of people on cabs sometimes. You know. <laughs> yeah, and it's that sort of team. And, but would you say that I guess there's a stage at which other people can input um, comments or feedback before before that kind of formal evaluation or that meeting or whatever? Um, yep. so that you can yep. and understand, that, yeah. And that's, that's the way organizations work. If you think about it, you have a, a manager for a functional team. That manager goes to his individual contributors and gets get their feedback on, on things that he has to maybe vote on later or give perspectives to his director. Mm -hmm. The director does the same thing for the VP. The VP does the same thing for the senior VP, all the way up to the CEO. One of the things that we always try to talk about, even from an ITO lifecycle perspective, that operations gives feedback to service transition. Service transition gives feedback to design. Design gives feedback to service strategy. That's how we get strategic intent and 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 and, and better insight to what's going on to operations and the other phases of the life cycle without having to bring that whole value chain into a meeting to talk about something. So yeah, yeah, absolutely. And this is kind of a related question that just popped up um from another listener named Matt and he's asked um he says, my comment would be you can bring a lot of complexity to planning and designing um, processes but like this, but you can't expect everyone 
to work at that level of complexity? So how do you find the balance? Uh, you define the balance based on the, the outcome that you're trying to achieve at the end of the day, because sometimes we forget about the outcome. And or, or if, you, if you think about um, methodologies like the five whys, if you want to look that up on the Internet, where you ask, you know, you know, why are we doing this? Then you get to you know, the tactical reason. Why are we doing this? Get to the strategic reason. Mm -hmm. As you start doing stuff like that, you also need to think about the roles and and the people that are involved in helping make those decisions. And then if you get the decision up at a higher level, those things should trickle down and, and actually inspire the individual contributors and stuff at a lower level to do the right things on behalf of the business instead of just doing a lot of things on behalf of the business. Yeah, yeah, okay, yeah, makes sense. Okay, fantastic. Well, I think that's all the questions that have popped up for the for the moment um thanks everyone some really good uh, detailed questions there and um and obviously we you know as you say Anthony there's parts of this that you could talk um a lot more about um for a lot longer um but we will come to the end of this session i think just now um and, and one other thing yes, one other thing yeah, go ahead. If, if people want to connect with me on linkedin ask more questions and so forth feel free i, I don't mind fantastic <laughs> so. okay brilliant um that's great and I can always include um I'll include obviously your details and um, your full name and everything in the in the follow-up email so that's great um so thanks again everyone for listening and um of course thanks to Samanage for sponsoring today's webinar um and thank you Anthony for joining and being our guest expert speaker today thank you hope everybody enjoyed fantastic thanks again bye for now bye